Hello, and welcome to the U.S. Chamber Foundation's Path Forward series. Today, we're focusing on one of the lasting business impacts of the pandemic, remote work. For many businesses in critical industries and the essential employees who make up their ranks, remote work was never an option. They kept coming in day in and day out to keep people safe, to keep our systems running, and to keep our economy functioning. But many other businesses shifted their operations, in some cases overnight, to navigate a new and unknown public health threat. More than two and a half years later, many have continued to operate in this new virtual environment. Zoom and Teams have in many cases replaced in-person meetings. Living rooms, bedrooms, and kitchens have become workstations. And roommates, spouses, parents, children, even pets have become coworkers. For many businesses and industries, it appears that remote and hybrid work are here to stay. What does that mean for productivity? What does it mean for employee morale, for onboarding those just entering the workforce, and for developing the careers of the next generation of business leaders? We have a terrific lineup today joining us to unpack these questions and more. Dr. Stephen Davis is the Distinguished Service Professor of Business and Economics at the University of Chicago School of Business. Todd Heiser is a Principal and Co-Managing Partner and Director in Gensler Chicago office. Let's get right to it. I'm going to start with Dr. Stephen Davis. You know, so we saw this rapid shift to work from home across all kinds of sectors. So here we are, three years into the pandemic. What are some of the key takeaways? Kind of what, what's here to stay, do you think? Thanks, Suzanne. It's, it's great to be here. Yeah, there was this huge shift. Um, basically, there's five or six times as much work from home now as there was back in 2019. And the data from various sources suggests we've sort of settled down, so that's probably going to be the norm going forward. You know, what's, what, what's interesting about this is the speed with which it happened, as you mentioned, but also that, you know, it's, it's shaking out very differently in different firms and sectors. So one, one thing that helps it work is in businesses, in activities where you evaluate people based on their output rather than watching their inputs then remote work tends to work pretty well because it doesn't require profound changes in management practices and how the organization works. But if you are accustomed to monitoring your employees directly in order to assure that they were working hard, doing the right kinds of things, well, then the shift to remote work uh, is a whole new ball game for you and, and presents lots of challenges that I think companies are still uh, trying to work their way through. So when you think about, uh, let's, let's start with the preferences of employers. What are we seeing when we talk to employers about what they really want in balancing remote, real life, real in-person and hybrid work? Yeah, so, so employers are adapting. Um, as I mentioned before, for many of them, it requires different management practices, different recruiting practices and different retention strategies. So I'll give you an example, just a very concrete example. Um, some employers, sometimes reluctantly, reluctantly, sometimes happily, have put a lot more emphasis on uh, remote work opportunities to recruit and retain talent. But then it dawns on them, well, look, I can turn this challenge into an opportunity by expanding the geographic reach of, say, my recruiting efforts. Because if I'm going to let somebody work from home two, three days a week, then I can expand the domain over which I'm looking for new recruits. And that makes it easier in some cases to diversify the talent pool and sometimes even to pay lower wages because somebody who's living in a uh, less expensive location um, might be quite happy with a uh, wage that seems low for a big city, but might, might, might be quite generous uh, for a medium sized cities. So there's ways to try to turn these challenges into, op into opportunities. And that, that's one example. So turning the table to the employee side, what are you and your colleagues seeing about employee preferences? Yeah, the key thing to understand is they like it. Not all of them, but the majority of them like the opportunity to work from home, not all the time, but a couple of days a week. They like the time savings in commuting they like the flexibility in time management. So if their kid is coming home from school at 3.30, they can be there to 
beat the kid or if the kid's you know not feeling well, they can look after the kid during the day. They like the sense of personal autonomy. So they really like it. But it's also important to understand their perceptions of the benefits might not be aligned with that of the employers. And I'll give you an example. Um, the average worker thinks they're more productive working from home than in the office. The average employer thinks they're a little bit less productive. But when you drill down a little bit further and you ask workers, and we've done this repeatedly in our surveys, well, what's the source of your extra productivity? You know, why, what makes you more productive? The lion's share of what they attribute the extra productivity to is they don't, they save time on commuting. Okay, well, that's important to understand. It's probably not what the employer has in mind when they think about productivity. But to the worker, it makes a lot of sense. I don't spend two hours a day commuting or 90 minutes a day commuting. And they even devote some of that time back to the job. So just recognizing what it is that employees perceive and why they perceive it can help you go a long way into understanding your workers, but also perhaps making the employment relationship one that they find attractive that also works for you. And that's a great point about making it attractive. We hear employees talk about the fact that employers have to earn the commute, right? What makes it worth it to show up? And so what are your insights there? What makes it worth it? What does earn the commute for a new generation? Yeah, that, earn, earn your commute is a great phrase because partly because you know, during the pandemic, um, many people showed that they could work effectively, uh, often under duress uh, from home. And so then when the boss says, well, we, re we really need you to come back to the office because you, know, you weren't, uh, yeah, because you're not as productive at home, that, that argument just doesn't fly. Now, what can the employer do concretely? Key thing is to think about which tasks that you want your employee to perform can be done well in a remote setting. Maybe it's working on the spreadsheet, writing the memo, and which tasks, which activities really call for this kind of close in-person interaction, collaboration, informal, informal mentoring, and so on. And then you gotta think about, okay, we need to divide up the work week so that the tasks that can be done as effectively and maybe even more effectively at home, they get done there. And the tasks that can be done in, in the office, well, we really need to make sure those happen when people are in the office or when more generally when they're on the work site. That then leads to a question, okay, how are we going to coordinate people, the right people to be in the, in the work site at the right time? So these are big challenges for managers, but it starts out with thinking about what can be done effectively where. And once you think you have an answer to that question, you can start to think about, well, how do I need to reorganize the workplace? What kinds of schedules do I need to have in place? Do the, do the schedules have to be decided at the team level, at the individual level, at some higher level of the organization? Those are practical questions you really need to address if you're going to succeed in this world where many of your employees are working remotely uh, at least part of the week. The, the flip I've heard of, of earn your commute is earn your office, right? So we have some office, we'll talk about this in a minute, I'm sure with our Gensler executive, you know, we have some offices reconfiguring and saying, well, then we need less space and employees saying, no, I miss my office and my desk. And so that earn your office is the flip side of it. I, I guess I wanna ask you a different type of question, which is, I hear you and understand the task and scheduling and which work can be done most effectively where decisions that managers and employees should likely be working together. On the softer side of things, and perhaps this is more of an arrogant employer view, so you can correct me, I worry a little bit that it's easier to recruit people if you tell them they can work remote or hybrid because they think that's the best thing for their career, but I worry that it's true that it's harder to retain those people because they're not as attached to your culture. They're not getting mentorship. They're not building relationships at the office. And so, you know, I don't want to be this CEO telling people they have to eat their broccoli all the time, but do you think there's any truth to the non-task, non-scheduled part of work that actually earns employee loyalty and culture over time? Yes, I do. And this, this issue comes up over and over again in conversations with uh, senior executives. So a couple things about this. First, it means you have to start thinking 
consciously and carefully about how you promote that kind of interaction that generates attachment to the company and coworkers, which is often an important part of it, because it's not just going to happen accidentally to the same extent as it did back before the pandemic struck. Now, exactly how to bring that about might mean different things in different companies. It might mean more conscious efforts to have some social events during lunch or right after work, or you might need to spend more time and company resources on three or four times a year, getting employees together in person in a non-work setting where there's some activities, some professional activities going on, but also a big part of the focus is letting them bond as human beings, because that's what, that's the source of much of the attachment that you talked about. That's how culture gets transmitted. The other thing to say, and I, I, I find this disconnect when I talk to managers, especially senior managers, and then when you talk to younger people. Younger people grew up in an environment where the way they socialize is very different from, say, the environment that I grew up in, where you, know, you didn't do it on the internet. We, we met people. Maybe we talked on the phone. Um, but we certainly didn't uh, spend hours and hours in the evening on video chat things. But a lot of the younger people grew up that way. So for them, that's a, that's a typical um, way to socialize and to form and sustain relationships. And I think I don't, I don't have a great solution, but you need to recognize that as a senior manager, when you talk about, yes, we all need to get together and form our bonds, just recognize that the way your younger employees have formed and sustained their friendships is very different from your experience. Uh, and it's, it's, it's worth keeping that in mind when you think about, well, what will appeal to them? What will work for them? And it's not necessarily the same thing that will work for, for your 40 and 50 year olds uh, in your company. So kind of trying to close that generational divide is I think part of the solution that we're groping towards. Yeah, I have a 16 year old at home that seems to be all of the above, <laughs> all in person, all online, all video, you know, all of the above. But but going back, I think, to your broader point, this it, talking through the generations has always been an issue for corporate culture. It's always been something. I think what's different about this moment is that the change happens so suddenly. So instead of an evolution to this kind of work where the generations could show each other how it could work and what's important. It happened overnight. You know? And so it's yeah. just a really different situation. We're all in and we're lucky to have experts like you help guide us through it. Let me ask you one question before I bring our next guest in. Talk to us a little bit about what you're learning about the potential long-term economic impact of this quick change. Yeah, I think it's mostly a positive. There's certainly some challenges along the way, but let me enumerate some of the positives and I'll do it quickly because we've talked about some of them before. Average worker saves more than an hour a day, mostly on commuting, but also on grooming time when they work from home rather than the office. You multiply that by tens of millions of people who don't commute on a given day, that's a lot of time savings. So that's one big benefit. Second, there's the flexibility and time management we talked about briefly before, and there's just the, the sense of personal autonomy, okay? People value that a lot. Third, less commuting also means less fuel consumption, uh, less pollution emissions. That also has value. Fourth, there's an opportunity for people to spread out a bit. That means maybe highly paid professionals who used to live in the city because they like the amenities and they didn't want to have a long commute. Now they're spreading out to the suburbs. They can get bigger homes, bigger yards. That's, that's a challenge for cities, but it also means that young people who in the past maybe couldn't afford to live in major city centers, now it's more affordable uh, than it was, at least relative to living out in some suburban area. And that means the young people can take advantage of the networking opportunities that dense urban areas um, offer. So there are a lot of benefits um, but there are also a lot of things to work out. There are these challenges, these managerial challenges we've been talking about, which can cause productivity problems in the short term. The other challenge, which we haven't talked much about, is for cities themselves. You know, there was a, cities are experiencing reductions in the, in the value of their commercial real estate, which is a big part of their tax base. There's less in the way of transit revenue because fewer people commute in. 
there's less in the way of spending on goods and services in the in the in the cities because of less commuters and sometimes because of uh, fewer residents. That reduces sales tax revenues. So big challenges for cities in the years ahead. I think to me that's the biggest uh, long term challenge. But I largely see benefits because of the uh, improvements to the quality of lifestyles. And I think we'll eventually work through these managerial challenges uh, that are that we're struggling with right now. Thank you for that. We're going to bring you back in for audience questions we're already receiving. Uh, but first, I'm going to bring in your co-panelist. This is Todd Heiser with Gensler. Todd, thank you so much for being with us. And, you know, what we were just talking about is how do you make hybrid work successful for recruiting, for retention, for productivity? Uh, and your research and your work says the actual work environment has a big impact on that. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so, you know, we just re released our 2022 workplace uh, survey, and it studies exactly what you're talking about. I was listening and found it uh, really, uh, really meaningful. So we've been studying work for decades, and we know that a, that a, that a really tailored, well-studied space that's specifically designed to support a company's workforce in ways that they uniquely need it, it's really important. And so companies are increasingly, even before the pandemic, they were increasingly asking workers to come into the office to collaborate in different ways. But now I love kind of earn the commute, right? But they need to create a new value proposition that helps workers understand why it's valuable for them to be there. Just to be together, it's not a good enough answer anymore. They really need to have an office that acts as a magnet for engagement, culture, and fulfilling work. And so I think that's part of the answer. So give us an example. What have you seen in an office environment that makes it more engaging and fulfilling to be there? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, that's a great question. So an office uh, used to be a status symbol. It actually used to be delivered based on hierarchy or position. And now private spaces focus spaces. So our research recently told us in 2022 that people are coming back to the office for uh, focus, right? And if we would have looked at that early in the pandemic, we would have said people are coming back uh, when they come back for collaboration. That shifted. So now they're actually coming back for focus. And I think, you know, I, I talk about things like office for a day, right? The ability, you, you said it actually in your opening statement, you've got a roommate, you've got a spouse, you've got kids, you want to get away. And I think offices are pulling people back for exceptional technology, for a private space, for something that they can't get at home. But the value proposition has really changed in that it's not free food, which it was pre-pandemic or, or, or amenities. It is those things. And I don't want to, I don't want to say that it's not those anymore. It's those and the other things. Another thing that I think, you know, I talk a lot about is that companies are bringing people back for learning opportunities. So they're actually saying learning is the new amenity. Those things that you learn on the job are skills that you carry lifelong, right? And they're an ability to learn something in the office, whether that's as something as, as, as simple as, you know, learning how to, to, to kind of uh, build a better spreadsheet, all the way to kind of, you know, ways to engage with clients are ways that I see my clients bringing people back. <clears throat> so talk to me about the opposite. So I was in an office recently that the CEO took great pains to design along the lines that you're talking about, only to find some rebellion among her people when they were asked to put their things in lockers as opposed to having permanent space that was theirs. And she thought all the collaboration space would be the learning space, the growth space that was used. But people, in fact, missed privacy, a sense of personal space, personalizing their space. So talk to us about the flip side. What are the worst practices that you're seeing right now? Well, I think the thing about it is, is that my my quick phrase that you said, earn the, earn the commute, I often say magnet as opposed to mandate. You want the office to be a place that brings people together because they want to come there. You want people to want to be there. You want them to be able to talk about their experience outside of you know, the office with their colleagues, because that's what kind of binds us together. I call it sticky space. It's not a great word, but you want people to bring their whole selves to work, right? And I talk to kind of clients consistently about designing space that supports the whole human. And I think, you know, 
gone are the days of thinking as employees as metrics, right? I mean, before the pandemic, everything was measured by per square foot, right? We talked about how many square foot per person would an office fit, really driven by that. And I think the pandemic, as your as your you know last kind of speaker actually so eloquently said, has kind of shifted, right? As we've actually reduced some of that density because people do have the opportunity to work other places, we've opened up the opportunity to give people a little bit more. Great technology, an ability to use something that they haven't actually used before. You know, I think actually I work with a, a great client, a major financial institution that because they actually didn't have quite as much density, they were able to go back to assigned seats and their client, their, their employees love it. I like to think about this in, in this way, right? Employees really need to be thought of as consumers. And every day that we go into the office, we're going to buy something. We're going to buy a, you know, kind of buy a setting to sit at for a day. And tomorrow we might like something different. And the more we can think about knowledge workers as consumers, the better off we'll be in creating high performing exceptional office space. What about the question I, I was just asking a minute ago about, are we sure when an employee says what they want that they know what they want? <laughs> yeah, that's actually, um, that's that's really interesting. I, I, I think that, Really, that comes from a space, you know, high performing spaces don't happen by accident. They require research, planning, strategizing and designing that really supports every worker. And I think, you know, sometimes people will ask for things that you really have to dig into the into the 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 problem to ask themselves, what is going to give this worker a greater sense of well-being and balance? Because inevitably it's going to support them more and make them more productive. And so I think the only way they, we do that is we start to think about the tasks. I love actually the previous speaker kind of talking about thinking about the tasks that people do and actually thinking about those tasks and breaking them down into activities and taking a deep dive into someone's calendar and asking them what they're doing every moment of the day to understand what kinds of spaces and environments can, can support them. So I'll often say to people, and we say this as a firm, if you believe that actually the next two to three years are going to be a set it and forget it workplace, it's not going to happen. The future is really going to be about beta testing. It's, about, it's, it's going to be about study. And it's, it's going to be about digging into feedback from individual workers to understand what is really driving you know, their performance and, and really how they want to work. I'm so interested in you saying that because it's not making assumptions on either side. It's not yep. employers making assumptions about what employees want or even assuming the employees know what they want. It's trying to use data to really understand how people are spending their time. I think that's that's a really important comment. And it reminds me that one thing we're seeing or hearing about from a lot of employers is they thought density would be reduced as yep. people went hybrid. But in fact, I'm curious if you're seeing this in your clients, that what most people want, particularly as they start their careers, is if they're going to commute in, if they're going to put makeup on and shoes and pants and all the things you have to do in an office, they want it to be worth it, which largely means the senior management has to be there. They don't yep. want to, you know, I had a young employee here one day tell me, I have no agency, right? I can't decide when the meetings are. So if I choose to just come in on a certain day and I commute and I put my makeup on and I show up and none of you are there, it's a really frustrating experience. So I think best practice seems to be at least coming together around core days. So if someone does put that investment in, they show up and see other people. So how is that impacting density? Yeah, so I think actually there's definitely core days. And I, I think that, you know, I talk about five points and I'm going to stitch together your last question in this one. So I think it it's a little bit of these five points of it's actually this idea of reinvention and reinvention is the flip side of disruption. And so I think it's reinventing our work week. It's thinking about when people need to be together in space. And we've actually kind of taken calendars. I often say curate your day and understand if Mondays and Fridays are primarily focus days and you can do that at home, then bundle it towards the center of the week. But that's probably different for each team in your organization. The second thing I say is, you know, this idea of vitality. 
So for so long, we thought of the workplace as a viable space. And what I mean by that is it existed day after day. People showed up, they did something that was eight to five, nine to six, whatever it was, maybe more. It was viable. It existed there all the time. We could count on it. But we want to shift actually to a workplace that's vital, right? This idea that it's alive and well, and people are choosing when they want to be there. And they're actually using kind of, you know, I, I say kind of the creation of, social media in a physical space. They want, or you want your teams to talk together and understand like, hey, I'm gonna be there on Wednesday and it would be great to do this. The same way we might use Instagram or the same way we might use Facebook to actually say like, hey, I'm doing this, would be interesting to have you join. And so I call that kind of this idea of social network in a physical space. You know, sustainability, this is one thing too. I love, I have clients that actually say, we're gonna close the office on Fridays because we're going to actually save the electricity. We're gonna, we're gonna give people a clear answer of what we want. Another one and two that I think are really important is this idea of inclusivity, the power of all. You said it, you know, managers need to come in. They need to walk the walk. They need to talk the talk. There can't be two cultures. But I think this power of all is really important for something that I call peripheral intelligence. And then finally, I say accountability, trust or bust. If you don't trust, if everyone doesn't trust that we're gonna do the best and we're gonna come together for the collective good, it's a bust. And I think those are some you know, five or six things that I'm really talking about with my clients to really drive engagement. And it does mean a shift, right? It means a little bit of a reinvention of what we think is the world of work. Speaking of things you're talking about with your clients, can you tell our audience about the concept of peripheral intelligence? Yeah, I love this, right? So the office for many years was about accelerated serendipity. We wanted things to happen quicker. And so hence, I think the focus on so many metrics, right? And actually so much conversation about innovation. But the big shift in the return to work is really this idea of peripheral intelligence, Companies have so much institutional knowledge and innovation in people. And you know, you really want to be able to tease that out of them. You want them to bring their whole selves, their whole minds to work. And I think it only really happens when you're in a physical space. If we're on a Zoom meeting and we don't have the opportunity to listen to a manager or listen to a young person with an innovative idea, we lose this whole banter that happens in an office. And so if you're on a high performing team and you sit next to someone who's been doing this for 10 or 15 years, you learn how that person talks. You learn their sales techniques. You learn actually how they interact with team members, how they treat them. And you learn that through osmosis. And so I believe that this idea of peripheral intelligence, that which we get in a physical space lives on the edge of something. It's periphery learning. And it actually kind of creates a learning organization that flattens out the hierarchy because anyone, because there's a ticket for admission to the office, has the ability to see how other people are acting and then embody some of those traits to better themselves. And they also, on the flip side, learn what they don't want to be. And so I believe that offices have a really important, or the office of the future has a really important part of giving or imparting this knowledge, peripheral intelligence to all workers of all demographics and any age. I mean, I love the idea that no one knows as much as everyone. And if you come into an office, you've probably experienced that. I want to bring uh, Stephen back in actually on that point. And we have audience questions for both of you. So the question that I want to ask is, is given what Todd just said, do we need a whole new vocabulary to talk about this? I mean, we talked about building trust. We talked about building empathy. But if we're trying to explain to employees why we think they grow and develop better when they can have the benefits of peripheral intelligence, or employees are trying to explain to us the way that they grow socially better, uh, do we just need a whole new kind of vocabulary for this? I don't know if we need a new vocabulary, but more communication is certainly going to be helpful. Um, you know, this idea that nobody knows as much as everyone, um, you know, that, that's a great point. But, you know, it's true, it's true in the virtual space as much as the physical space. So I, I have a slightly different view on this. While there's lots of peripheral intelligence we gather in the physical space, the, like we're having this conversation now in, in, in the virtual world, so to speak. And, uh, I think we're learning from each other. 
Um, we're certainly bouncing ideas uh, off of each other and sharing them with our audience. So that's another way in which you know we can we can have or develop peripheral intelligence. Uh, it's not just who's around us physically, but it, it's who's around us, who we can interact with uh, in uh, in virtual space. Um, so there's a lot there's a lot to grapple with here, um, and I think a a willingness to, to speak to your point about vocabulary, a willingness to engage others at the same level in the organization or at a different level of the organization who might have different perspectives uh, on the value of remote work and how to make, to speak to uh, you know, uh, Todd's point, how to make the office environment work physically. You know, that's, that's, those are important conversations to have. One last point on this, and it's sort of implicit in some of the things that we've said in this conversation, but I wanna make it explicit. Individuals differ a lot in how much they like the whole remote work phenomenon and in how they interact with others. But organizations are also differently equipped and differently positioned in their ability to make effective use of remote work. So there, this is not a one size fits all um, yeah. issue on either the employer side or the worker side. And I think that's also a very important thing to recognize. Yeah, I, I think, think that's such a great point. It, it's ahead, gotta sir. be for folks. No, I was just gonna say, I love that. I mean, it has to be a tailored and bespoke solution. Yeah, I, I think it's so important because one of the things I remember studying early in my career are the difference in people who are verbal processors and nonverbal processors. Mm -hmm. And I find in the remote world, the verbal processors can really dominate. Where in the real world, if we're all around a table, it, it's easier to notice who's being quiet, to give grab them for a minute after the meeting and get their feedback. Um, but the, the extrovert has a not necessarily an advantage, but certainly can take up more of the room in the Zoom world in, in a way that it requires a different type of management skill to get things out of them. But speaking of that, I, I have so many questions. We have a lot of audience questions. Here's one. Uh, one audience question is coming from a CEO who is saying they have core days right now, they're hybrid right now, but only because he still has a lease. And the minute this lease is up, he's out and fully remote. And we were just in New Orleans, as I said, with a group of CEOs who there, there was a lot of that feeling. So my question to both of you is, is this just the beginning? In other words, do you think as more and more leases expire, companies are gonna give up even more of their office space? I, I don't actually, I have, a couple clients I work across the globe and I don't think clients will give up office space only because I have several clients that actually were at the termination of their leases at the beginning of the pandemic and they gave up their office spaces. And through the pandemic, we've designed new spaces for them, high performing different spaces with different kit of parts to support the new world of work. They're different and less but the ideas of their brand, how do they come together? Where do they bring clients are really important burning questions. I think that actually over the next, uh, I would say a couple of years, we are gonna really redefine what an office looks like. And I think as such, it's gonna redefine what a city looks like. I've designed <laughs> several projects that actually look less like office buildings and more like mixed use that have a little bit of residential that have a little bit of office in them and have a lot of bit of services. And what I think about that is that I don't think people are gonna give up space. I think they're gonna trade up space for better space. So let me, let me ask uh, Stephen, let me ask you a question. We talked a little bit about employees and the next generation and their expectations, but search firms are saying CEOs have expectations now. And that includes not moving to where the corporate headquarters is, that you increasingly have CEOs saying, I can work from anywhere. This is where my family is. I'd love the job, but I'm gonna do it from here and travel as necessary. And so if you think about it from a senior management perspective, what would a senior manager have to do to build culture if he or she were remote? Yeah, that's a tough one. And, and just a factual observation first, if you look at the, um, the big increase in, in remote work since the pandemic struck, and you ask, how does it relate to earnings? How does it relate to education? There's a remarkably striking relationship. It's the higher earnings folks 
who are the ones who actually get to do a lot more remote work on average. And the folks down there in the bottom of the organization, uh, by and large, are not working remotely as much. That does present challenges on many dimensions, both a sense of fairness, but also transmission uh, of culture and so on. And Suzanne, I want to go back to something you said earlier and related to this question, which is the difference between uh, verbal processors and visual processors. I think that was your language or something like that. But it's also there's differences between people who communicate well in person through body language and uh, expressions and, and so on. And then there's people who speak very well in in written form because they organize their thoughts, they write clearly. Some people do both, but most people are better at one than the other. The kinds of communications that are required in a remote environment, especially if people are working asynchronously, are quite different than those where everybody's physically present. And so that means you either got to find different kinds of managers for a remote environment, or you've got to upskill some of the managers who were accustomed to dealing with people in a face-to-face -face way, maybe they don't have the best writing skills because you need, you need your employees, your, the, the people you're managing, they have to understand what you want from them. And if you're trying to do it in a remote way and do it in written form, well, then you better make sure that your written communications are extremely clear because they just can't pop into your office and say, oh, I didn't really understand what you meant. Can you explain it to me? Or they, they, they could send you a little email message or chat box message, but then it's like saying, well, you didn't write this very clearly the first time, you know, I'm a little, so, so there's a whole host of, of, of really interesting issues tied up here. Uh, not just what the senior managers want, but how it relates to what the, uh, you know, the, their subordinates feel in the organization, how they're going to communicate. If you're a CEO and you're planning to work remotely, you should ask yourself, am I a good communicator at a distance? Because if I'm not, then that's probably not the right way for you to work in your organization. It's so interesting. It gets back to the speed question, right? This all changed so quickly that mm -hmm. I'm not sure that management training, leadership training, skill development, uh, moderation skills, et cetera, have, have necessarily kept up. Todd, what are you seeing in terms of new talent entering the market and their expectations for a work environment? More specifically, you know, the number one concern we hear from small, large CEOs across the country is a lack of workers, a real worker shortage, real competition for talent. And so what do you think the next generation is looking for in an office environment? I cut out for a minute. Are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Stephen, can you hear I, me? I lost I audio for a minute. Are you there? I can Okay, so while we try to get uh, the back office to talk to Todd and see when we have him back, Stephen, do you have a view of that? Of If we're trying to create an environment to attract new generations of talent to our companies, what should we as managers be thinking about? Well, you, you and Todd have both made this point before, which I think is a good one. There has to be a reason why people go to the office. They, they now need to feel at the end, they go, they go home at six o'clock or something. And they have to feel like it was good for me to have commuted to the office today. Because and that's very different than before the pandemic, where there was an, kind of an understanding and norm that, well, you needed to be in the office or the work site to do your job, because that's just the way the things were. Um, that's what we'd always been accustomed to. So I'm very much on the same page as Todd about you know making uh, it, I liked his word vital. You want to make the office feel like a vital place. That doesn't mean you need to come in five days a week. In fact, it may be easier for the office to be a vital place if you only go there two days a week, <laughs> if you go there five days a week. Um, so it can, you know, it, it can be in terms of learning opportunities you get. It can be in terms of special equipment uh, that you have at the office. It can be in, in, in your ability to interact with people in small groups in a way that's both informative and enjoyable that is very hard to replicate uh, in a remote setting. But some, there's gotta be some reason at the end of the day uh, why the employee says, you know, I'm glad I came here. And this is something employers should be thinking about. You, you can use surveys of your employees. You can have conversations with them. But you, you might want to think about asking them at the end of the day, are you glad that you came to the work site today? Or would you rather have saved the 90 minutes and done your job at home? Okay. 
uh, you need to have you need to have an answer to that question, and your answer needs to align with the expectations and the perceptions of your employees uh, if you want to make it um, a sustaining and fulfilling place to to work. Todd, I think we have you back. Yeah, Let me ask sure. you a question. What do you Sorry think? That, what's your guess? Predict the future for us. What's the new norm in terms of days in the office? I think the center of the week. So I have a client that actually studied this, a major financial institution, and they uh, had 40% of their talent come back on Mondays, 20% on Fridays, and their core days of Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, they were approaching 80%. And our workplace survey has studied things that were uh, very similar to this. I think Mondays are often days where people actually set up themselves for the week. A lot of company-wide meetings, marketing discussions, where will people be? And I think those are days that actually people are spending a lot of time collaborating across the globe. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays are core days where people come together for their teams. And I think if you ask me honestly, I think Fridays are probably gone for the world of work in an office space. I think people will use those days for focus, to recharge and reconnect. And I think they're going to be the days that people spend maybe uh, you know, out with clients, learning something new. And so I really think those core days of Tuesday through Thursday are going to be really ideal or Tuesday through Friday. You know, it's interesting. I learned something from a CEO. I'm curious. I'm going to ask you a question about this. But what I learned was it was another company that had their mandatory two days a week in the office, work it out with your team, have focus days, core days. But they added a benefit, which we ended up copying here, which was and then work two weeks a year remotely, wherever you want. Yep. And it really helped people with their travel vacations or second homes or going to see their parents or whatever that looked like. And it was surprising how popular that benefit was. So in addition to hybrid work or remote work, um, do you see other unique benefits like that or unique arrangements like that coming out of the pandemic that might stick? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we we actually see a lot of uh, employees actually shifting the value proposition away from the amenities, things such as free food and giving other amenities. Uh, we've heard a lot about unlimited vacation, right? The idea that actually people can work from anywhere. Uh, we've actually learned of clients that actually have shifted away from these ideas of, you know, food or amenities such as health club and shifting those to things that people will really value, height adjustable desks for their home offices. They've shifted these to technology allowances, great monitors, actually ways to work from home. And so we've seen the whole value proposition of work in our research really shift. I think, you know, one thing that I'll say about all of these benefits, people, and you asked me a question before I caught out, you ask about young people. You know, people want a workplace that provides them a platform to thrive. And that really means something a little different for each person. But for the most part, it means offering them flexibility and choice and the ability that through the benefits of a company, that that company is going to support their physical, their mental, and their emotional well-being. And they're going to place connectivity and equity at the forefront. And I think what you just said to me about giving someone two weeks away to really work from any place really places equity and their well-being at the forefront. And it, it says, listen, you re hire really intelligent people and you want to give them the freedom to choose the way they want to work. I think that's right. And I think you've both mentioned it as we wrap up here. I would just highlight you've both talked about trust. <laughs> you've talked about empathy. You've talked about building relationships, personalizing that having managers who understand their employees and what they need as individuals and also helping them understand by helping them understand their calendars, how they're spending time and how it might work. I really appreciate you both being willing to be here. It's, it's, I think history books will be written on how much change happens so quickly in this moment. And so for all the employers that you're talking to today across the country and around the globe, you've been a big help in helping us think about it. And I hope you'll come back. Thanks Thank so you. much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks all of you for tuning in. I, I can't believe we're wrapping up a year of Path Forward. And I find myself encouraged and, and optimistic about the future. We are very appreciative of your participation and engagement in this series. I hope you'll think about sending us ideas and topics that you might recommend for 2023, which I hope will be a remarkable 
and if I admit it, uneventful perhaps year. So wishing you and yours a happy, healthy holiday season and looking forward to seeing you in the new year. Until then, take care.